Hi, my name is Mitch Weisberg, and I'm one of the hosts of EdChat Interactive. Uh, today we'll be having Ken Halla, which who will be uh, talking to us um, in a few minutes. Um, Ken is a national board certified teacher. Um, he runs the U.S. government teachers blog. Um, if you haven't been to it, if you're at all interested in social studies, it's, it has some really, really interesting articles into it. In it, and I suggest uh, uh, googling it and and finding it. Um, he's the author of a book, Deeper Learning Through Technology, and he's a national known speaker. Um, uh, and he's going to lead a discussion with, with you all on how uh, we all are participating in a revolution towards the learner-centered classroom. So I'm going to bring my, I'm going to bring me down. I'm, I'm going to bring up. And I'm going to bring the slides up. So um, I'll, I'll stop my broadcast now, and I'll bring Ken up. Hey, everyone, and welcome. As I said, my name's Ken, but I have been teaching as of June 18th of this year, I will have finished 24 years of teaching, 17 years of which are in Fairfax County, Virginia. I'm in a very diverse school. I have, what do we have, 70% minority, 40 nationalities, 30% free and reduced lunch. And I think I'm here in part because that's how I grew up. I, I grew up mostly overseas, which is why you can see that picture there, the little one of my wife and, and kids, and we like to travel abroad. And that is on the wall, the lesser used wall portion outside of Beijing last August. And we had the great opportunity of going there. And as Mitch said, I do have a government teacher's blog, but I have a world teacher's, a U.S. history teacher's, and an econ teacher's because I actually am a department chair and I keep switching up what I'm teaching, taking whatever else everybody doesn't need or want. So this year I added AP Econ, for example. So that's my first slide. And Mitch, I have a second slide, I believe, as well. Okay, so I mentioned the top part, uh, and there's the book. If you become interested in it, it's on Amazon. If you ever wanted to follow me, um, I'm on Twitter, just at my name, or you can email me if you ever need to get a hold of me for any reason. But all the tools that I'm talking about today, if you were to copy down to bit.ly.com slash holla edchat, it will take you to the U.S. History Teachers blog. For that matter, if you Google me, any of my blogs have it. It's about three posts ago, and I have a video on how to do a lot of the things that we've done uh, since we're talking about one concept being flipping, and it's just a six-minute video. And I have the slideshow that Mitch has shown up there and a couple other things as well. It was put on my blogs, if you follow me at all, a couple days ago, and then I added stuff to it. So it's an old post with new stuff as of today. And so the concept today that I've been pushing uh, in my classrooms and with teachers that I teach is personalizing the classroom. And basically what I write on my blogs are three things. One, it started as content eight years ago. What are we? Seven years ago. There's 6,000 posts between the four sites now. And I was approached by Corwin about a, two years ago exactly, and they asked me if I'd would be interested in writing a book, and I already had a book in my head, so it, even though it took 14 months, it was more a process of working with an editor to get it out. And so the book is a practical guide of how to do it I, with all the research behind it, but I think a lot of the times we're given books as teachers that are just the theory and not how do I do this on daily class, daily, daily lessons. I have what I call kind of daily challenges to the teacher for each chapter and also how you can work in professional learning communities uh, as well. So um, what we're going to be talking today about is personalization and how do you do it with your own students. But to do that, the first thing I need to talk about is flipping. So if you can go to the third slide, Mitch, that'd be great. Oh, sorry. Uh, I got I picked this quote up last week, and you know it's funny. I had a presentation a few years ago where the teacher said, "Teaching is not listening, and learning is not uh, teaching is not talking, and learning is not listening." And he proceeded to talk for three hours, and most of us didn't learn. And so I like this quote from Ben Franklin because there is almost no lecture in my classes. Uh, they go to the involved to learn, but at the same time. 
you have to do some kind of presentation, some kind of contextualization. And so that statue is of obviously Ben Franklin, except it's a unique one to me. I lived in Paris during high school and two blocks from where Franklin lived in Passy, I was in a place called the Trocadero and that statue is today right outside the Trocadero Metro stop. So next slide, please, Mitch. Okay, and if this is small, all you do is you go to the slide and you click on it and the lower right, you will see the enlarge button and you can then uh, read it a little more easily. So flipping, when I started flipping, I've now gone four years of flipping. Uh, first of all, flipping tradition or originally started as we're going to take the lecture portion, we're going to drill it down to the most important elements and we're going to put it online um, on TeacherTube or I use YouTube and the kids will watch it at home and and we're going to get to what you what the kids can do later. I have some questions for you. And then you come to class and you do the discussion. So traditionally, I think of, say, my econ class this year that I did, micro and macro, especially micro, are not an easy topic. And if I had spent the whole time presenting the material and the kids had gone home and done the problem sets, we would have had a world of hurt. So in my case, did the videos at home. They came in, we briefly went over them in, say, 10, 15 minutes. And then I moved around the room from most of the classroom, uh, answering questions, catching the kids up uh, if they had been out, and, and making sure they had all their work in, et cetera. So that's one version. The second one, I started, I, one of the classes I teach is an ESOL World History One. And you're talking about kids who've been at 15 of my 30 kids have been in the US a year or two max. And so they're in many cases too polite and they don't want to take the time to um, or they don't want to raise their hand so the better way is to um, let them do it inside the classroom and part of the reason of doing that is also because in my class of 30 there might be five kids without a computer at home mind you they all have a phone and they can do that um, sorry someone just walked into my classroom thanks and and so I started out with my ESOL kids, the special ed department in my school has now done it as well. So we flip in the class, and we do the interactive. The flipping though has gone from 15 minutes that you might see on Khan Academy to anywhere from 12, maybe for an AP and for a standard class, five to seven minutes. And then where can you find flip videos? For example, if you were in my book, I have tons of resources for it for all different subjects, not just social studies. But you, you name your subject, middle school, high school, elementary, et cetera. If you go on my one of my blogs and for the people just popping in at the very end, I will have how you can get all the information I'm going through today. So you don't even need to take notes. Um, but one thing I do is I used to believe that I had to make all my um, videos, I, it, a, a strange concept, your kids like you better than the greatest expert in the world. They'd rather have you talk about Microsoft than Bill Gates. Uh, but I realized to some degree there's more value from stealing from a lot of people, which is what good teachers do. So my flips are a combination of me and a combination of a lot of other people who do it a lot better. And my view is if someone else is doing it better, then why not go with them? So that's the first one and leading to the kind of more important slide, which is the next one, Mitch. OK, so again, for the new people who just came in lower right, you can click on the of the personalized learning. You can click on it and blow it up to make it easier for you to see. So what's personalized uh, classroom look like? Uh, if you came into my World History one this morning, we did just a little bit in the beginning of we're, we're into the review for the state exam. Uh, and so I went and did a quasi quiz, if you will. I didn't count it just to see if they'd done any learning recently. And and while I was talking, I was walking around because um, I had in my case, I had maps up that they had to identify different things. Uh, after that point, it became a very not very traditional classroom like I'm looking at this picture we're all looking at my classroom is set up in a U not in rows and so 
typically several things are going on once we get started. One is that I'm walking around and I'm staring at my case at, at computer screens and at smartphones because you're allowed to use both in my classroom. And I am making, having little conversations. Can you tell me, uh, look map where this the where the Islamic Empire is or give me some advan uh, some advances made by the Islamic Empire and I noticed a couple of you coupling you if you came in if you click on someone's icon other than my own you can um, you're in a little chat room with them um, for personal conversations so that's one thing I'm doing the second thing is we use Google Drive or some of you may call it Google Classroom and so I can live, oh, literally see what they're working on. And so if you miss an assignment, I, I run back and forth to my desk and I say, hey, uh, John, you're, uh, you know, the second question you didn't understand, do you need me to come over there or did you leave it blank on purpose? And then I let them turn it in again because I don't see it as a game where I'm going to get them and get, get questions wrong. I want them to get it perfect. And so right now, as long as you're doing the work, a lot of the kids have really good grades. There are no late grades, uh, at least up until the test grade. Um, so what do you need to do all that kind of personalized learning? You, it does help to have technology. Um, I guess you could give them packets maybe, uh, but to me that doesn't work as well because you're just not getting the the up uh, to the minute time uh, period. Uh, for example, anything that is turned into me through Google Drive within half an hour of the class, as long as it's not an essay, then I grade it. And when we start the class, every kid has it. And matter of fact, it's funny. Kids will turn it in three minutes before class and say, why haven't you graded it? Because they're so used to having it kind of quickly done. So it does help. I prefer laptops, smartphones. The kids prefer. Uh, they also like it because they can turn their music on and the rule in my classroom is earbuds are fine as long as you can hear me and I can't hear your music. And then the last thing, what are the challenges? If you're starting to become what I call a facilitator as teacher rather than a sage on the stage, if you will, uh, your PLC might not be on board and or your department or your school. And Obviously, as a department chair, uh, that helps me that I have a platform. And what I find is I will lead a meeting, for example, by flipping the meeting and then running around uh, and, and having the teachers work on something. And that gets them to like it. That's how I got the special ed teachers to like flipping, for example. Um, students, the higher level you go, the, more, the less likely they're going to like it initially, like the AP kids. Are you to a lecture, write down, go home, read a book, do a problem set, come back, and they don't like to change. Uh, so what I found is all at once just helps. My econ kids, they had no problem because they just dove in and they did what I kind of led them to do. Um, and where to find training is the third one. Well, buy a book, buy the deeper, uh, buy my, um, my book. And, and or if you go to one of my blogs, even if you're not social studies, just type in flipping, just type in personalization, and you will get a world of um, coming back or individualization or individual. Uh, because I said I have now 6,000 um, posts between the four sites. And, um, and so that's that. Now what we're gonna do now is I'm gonna pause and if you have a question, I, I'm going to have three questions for you guys to kind of think about in the next 35 minutes. But does anybody have a question yet? And if it's not one of my questions, because you may steal my thunder, then I'd like to maybe address it, if that's okay with Mitch. And so you go in the lower right-hand column and you click on Ask a Question. So, so I have a question, and that, that is, you know, you're, you're talking about flipping. And... It just occurs to me that one of the things when we're talking about personalization is that if you're going to personalize class time, then you can't be using class time as the main means to impart knowledge. And you have to use the class name itself as a way to interact more with the students. Could you like correct me or could you elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah. Can you, so you're asking when do I impart knowledge basically? 
Right. So it's, it just seems, you know, you're talking about flipping, and flipping would, would take what the lecture would, would very often be in the classroom and moving it outside of the classroom, at which, which to me means that the reason why you would do that is to be able to spend more class time working individually with the students would, would be one reason. Is that true or is that I mean, why, what are some of the reasons behind, you know, moving the lecture to the after school? I have individual conversations with every one of my kids two or three times in a class period, in a 90 minute period. I don't think most people can say that. Now, it may not be, it may be some academic, answer this, tell me what's going on, give them a little kind of uh, formative quiz, if you will, formative assessment. Uh, it may be, why are you, you know, you got to catch up a little bit. Uh, you, you know, you were sick and, and what's a plan we can work at? It may be, uh, can you come after school? We need additional time period or what are the questions you have for me? Uh, there are actually a lot of questions for me, depending on the subject. If it's straightforward, like history of government, fewer questions uh, and uh, more questions, say if you do a math, a math set, a, uh, for me, a problem set in econ. But to answer your other question, or at least the one I got from it, why, how do you do the flipping? It, it's tough. Uh, and you're giving up you to, to some degree. And I, I think it was eight years ago, the first time I did anything technologically speaking in the classroom, I took kids to the lab back when we had labs. And they were doing something on causes of the Civil War. And they, I provided a bunch of links and they had to answer the main points that I had for the day. And I had them answer questions. They had to insert pictures. I'm big in kids finding pictures and other things for uh, technology. It helps because we learn visually. We don't learn, you know, obviously by writing as well. And at the end, I said, I'm going to give you a, an assessment and you can use your, um, what you, there were blog posts and you can use your blog posts and the kids did really well. And so everyone says, well, that's great. And I can give kids an assignment, go use the book, and um, they can use it on the quiz, they're going to do great. But what blew me away is when we got to the, four, uh, the summative as assessment, they did better than they'd done on anyone's before. And we, we talked about that, and we talked about why, and, and the why was because they had to grab onto it because they could ask me questions as they were working through the issues. And that that it made them it made it more there them and likewise with the flipping I tried a technique this year where I have gotten rid of I had no textbook in econ I mostly got rid of it in government and I have two thirds gotten rid of it in world history and next year the goal is to pretty much ditch the textbook and so I asked my kids why they like the videos more and one of the things they said is they physically like the fact that they could manipulate the, um, the uh, screen and they were in control and it's funny but I have three kids and all three of the kids like to sit with me when I'm making videos which you think is odd considering that it's a fifth grader and two seventh grader but it's like yeah. our children today are drawn to technology and one of the best teachers I had in my teacher classes said Ken you have to teach to the kids way of learning not to the style that you've learned. And even though I'm 24 years in and probably halfway to go, I keep that mantra in my head, teach best the way the kids, and today they're so involved in technology and a lot of people say, well, turn the phone off, but they go home and we can't turn the phone on, off. And so what I find, say, with reading a textbook is a lot of the kids are reading three pages in the textbook, getting bored and getting on the phone, reading another three, right. get on the phone as opposed to in a video which is quicker to the point and they're less likely to need another modality because they're already on one. And so mm -hmm. that has been an appeal for my students. So I just Thank like you. to point out to people that underneath your icon there's those two different uh, those two different buttons. One says raise hand and one says ask questions. One of the things that Ken 
asked is um, is to go ahead and ask a question. So if you have specific questions about leading your classroom into individualizing change, if you can ask those questions, that would be great. Um, or if you'd like to ask your question over video, uh, why don't you uh, click on the raise hand button. Um, I'll see your raised hand and then I can uh, draw you up. But I, I know I interrupted you, Ken, in the, in the middle. Why don't, why don't you continue? And, no, I'd love to um, answer questions. Okay. Um, now, you had a question for everybody else also. So why don't I do, are, bring myself down and pull up your slides again? And I think the next slide was going to be a question you had for everybody else or not. Well, before we get there, Mitch, were there any questions from anybody? No, there's no raised hands right now. Well, then go for um, the first no question. Questions. Okay. All right. So I'm going to stop my broadcast and I'll, I'll, I'll bring it up in a second. Okay. So what he, Mitch is going to bring up a slide with questions. And what I'd like to do after we're done is get into, say, uh, three groups of three people and make sure when you click on, I'm doing on my screen, that um, you have not locked your screen. In other words, when you came in the room, if you clicked on the lock, you then locked and no one can hear you. Um, so you have to make sure that's unlocked. Uh, but the question is, how might you start the year off with a flip video? Whenever I do presentations, I always tell them, I want you to walk away with something you can use in the fall of 2015. Uh, otherwise, it's going on a sh digital shelf and we're going to forget about it. So. If you're thinking ahead, and I've already done so, believe it or not, I lucked out and saw some of this past week, how would you start off the year with a flip video? And I'm not talking this, I mean, it, I guess it could be a summer assignment, but literally when you walk into class and you, you meet the kids and you're interacting on the first day, and you, what would you do? What would you have them look at the night after the first class and before the second class? And so to answer this, if you can just kind of morph into other groups. I'm going to do the same thing and I'm going to try to listen to you and then after, I don't know, five, ten minutes, maybe five minutes, I'll come back on stage and um, give you what I've heard. So if you can literally click, like I'm, clicking, I'm going to click on Marsha right now. One person I talked to from Bogota is flips all the time, which is awesome, but she's never done one on an intro as an introduction and another one was I just got the tail end is going to uh, get some statistics and and then have the kids look at that. But if you can give me my next slide, Mitch, please. Uh, and I got to blow this up to see exactly what I wrote there. But I was reading um, an article in the Washington Post. I believe it was last Sunday. And I'm outside of Washington, D.C., so it's one of the papers I read. And it was an article on the California drought and Western drought and, and the ramifications for that. And then I found a video, a three or four minute video on YouTube. Uh, and in particular, it had this amazing statistic that 90% of the world's wars are in countries or areas where drought is an issue, especially if you look at kind of the Fertile Crescent to the Mesopotamia kind of area or what once was the Fertile Crescent. And so I thought about that for my econ kids and I, I, I came to the conclusion that I am going to uh, have them go home and watch the short video and read the article and then use that theme throughout the year. I mean, you can do macro and micro uh, using that. I mean, if if Water is an inelastic uh, prop, uh, inelastic item, so people will be more willing to pay for it. Could it be a monopoly in a country? Uh, and yet at the same time, it could be monopolistic. These are just, uh, sorry, it could be perfect competition. These are just terms that you use in, use in micro. And then it brings a foreign exchange in terms of uh, countries going back and forth and what's water worth and inflation of water and all these things. So my thought is that I'm going to use this first introductory video. And the first day, I just get to know the kids. So this is homework, the first day, 15 minutes of homework total. Um, and I'm going to use this theme throughout the year 
And the reason being because we grab on and we remember stories. And so as teachers and students, we remember stories. So my story next year for econ will be the water story. And the graphics that are shown in that video are ones that I could never produce. Um, and again, if you want this thing later on and you go to the uh, link that I'm going to have at the end of this presentation, you can see the video yourself. So next question, please. All right, and I have to uh, minimize. What techniques can you use to make sure students are actually watching the videos? The problem I have had in the past is that it's not unlike any other assignment where some kids do the work and the higher level they are, the more likely they are to do it and the lower level, the less likely to do it. So what techniques have you used for those who have been flipping to make sure that your students are actually watching the videos at home? And so that's the next question. If you can tag a person and uh, see what they, they say. If you haven't done flipping, obviously, what do you think might be uh, done? So I'm going to grab Barbara now that I can finally see her. All right. So it looks to me like a lot of people are really getting the hang now of uh, clicking on other people and, and sharing some information. So um, I'd like to encourage you to continue to do that. Uh, what we're talking about is that if you were to think right now of a video that you would ask people to watch after their first class with you, um, what would that, actually, sorry, that was the, that was the last question. Uh, this question is um, if you're going to be assigning videos, what techniques do you think that you can use to make sure that students are actually watching the videos? And um, I think once we uh, get Ken back up here, uh, we're going to bring one or two of you up also to share some of the things that you talked about. So in a minute or so, um, I'm, I'm looking to see if Ken's free. Um, and I'm going I'm, well, I'm to come down right now. I'm going to talk to Ken for a second, and then I'm going to bring him right back up. How would you make sure the kids are watching the video, short of going to their house? Hey. <laughs> hey. Can you hear oh. me, Barbara? <laughs> Engaging, well, we do it with the Kahoot, Kahoot in them. Yeah, I can hear okay, you. Can you hear me? I can hear you beautifully. Yep. Can you explain what you mean by lag. cahooting them? What? Okay, fantastic. Mitch, if... Okay, so Barbara, if uh, you can just have, explain. We, have, we use the Get Kahoot, the Get Kahoot software, the app, to actually... So during the video, there are moments in the video where it, 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 it will allow certain pauses to ask questions based on what they've seen thus far. So you have... Uh, in two minute, five minute uh, intervals, that there are questions based on what they've seen. So if they're actually watching the video, or they actually watch the video, they should be able to respond to the questions, the Kahoot questions. Excellent answer. Does anybody else have another answer they'd like to share? I haven't heard from Marsha, for example. Marsha, do you want to come up on stage? Can you give us a wave, Marsha? Yes or no? Oh, you don't have a choice. Okay. Um, I just discovered that video note uh, app that you can put on your browser thing and that goes into Google Docs. And so I may have um, some questions that I want them to ask and they have to document what the evidence is within the video that answers that question. That, that, is, that is awesome. And that's, Mitch, if you can bring up my answer the, on the presentation, we've already hit a couple of my answers. And it's coming, coming. Okay, here we go. So uh, I think uh, that was just mentioned by Marsha using a Google Form. And again, at the end, I have a link to Google Forms um cahoots another way you even go on um if you type flipping in one of my blogs there's another one that's free and its name is escaping me uh that one of my co-bloggers has put up um 
to actually ask questions. I think it's actually, I take it back, it's TED Ed uh, allows you to put questions on their videos if you use theirs. Uh, if not, Kahoot's one way. A uh, daily quiz is something I've gone to in, in uh, some of my classes simply because some kids take notes differently than others. And speaking of which, I actually make a video on how to take notes because I think there's some kids who understand and taking notes on a video for a lot of kids is not as easy as taking notes from a book. Um, so I give them a quiz and they're allowed to use anything they have on that they've taken. It's mainly as a reward and they get no grade for the notes, but they get a grade for the quiz and they can't take the quiz unless they have done the notes. And again, with my no late grade policy, if for some reason they didn't do it, they can take it later. But I do make them stay after class or after school to take that quiz. So there's some incentive to do their work in that case. Um, said the Google form and then flexible due dates I already said uh, because again, we want them to watch all the videos. And if you can go to the next slide, Mitch. Okay, and then someone asked a question before I even get to the next slide. Why do we use homework? Why not use the beginning of the class period? I think it, my answer, we probably all have different answers, is it kind of depends on the class. Uh, if it's an AP class, I have a real hard time getting everything completely in and or want to reinforce what we've done. In my world history classes, it's a non-AP. If you work the time, minutes, you can do it without homework, and that includes the flipping. You can flip in the class, you can do all the work, you can have me buzz around the room and answer questions or ask you questions all within the classroom. And frankly, my AP kids, AP Econ, considered a fairly hard course, and the other AP I teach is Gov slash Comparative. Those kids have half an hour a night of homework. That's not a whole lot of homework. Um, but if you blow this up, and you're going to have to do it to be able to see it, um, I have a Google form, very simple one, and you can insert a link as I've done to the Washington Post. You can, ins uh, and to insert a link, by the way, you just put it in the question. Um, as long as it's an HTTP and you push back past the end of the link, um, it will show up this way. And then you go to insert video and you've inserted your video and then you insert, in this case, a paragraph question. And uh, that's another technique that you can use to make sure the kids are doing it. And it comes up in this case in an Excel spreadsheet. So not right or wrong, but very quickly who did it or who didn't do it. And then I have one question in the last six minutes. If Mitch can go one slide ahead. Um, and the question is, how will your classroom change with the flipping style? And how might uh, you do this for your first lesson of the year? I think I'm being repetitive. I've read this a couple of times and I, um, so the, the real question is, what are you going to do in class once they've gotten the video? And so for me, for example, I'm going to have them get into groups and discuss the video and discuss what they learned from it. And uh, since it's econ, I'm going to ask and what they think economics are uh, and, and how that relates to the study of micro and what micro is and how that relates to macro. Um, and so in my case, actually, I would ask what's micro and macro uh, is the fourth and fifth question. And so are there uh, any questions or thoughts? I think the easiest way, since we're time, we've got a limited time here, could you just ask a question? Mitch will see it and here pop it up on the screen. Actually, I can see it now. That, or don't ask a question. How might you, what might you do in the class after you've done your first flip? So if you actually thought of an idea for the fall, what might you do the next day with that video having been done? What kind of lesson might you do? And well, I may have cut him off by accident, but I'll bring him back up in a, in a few minutes. But I just wanted to, you know, I thought that uh, now is another time for you all to pair up 
and uh, describe how what type of changes you might have in your classroom if you were to go to the flip classroom. Uh, Ken's going to uh, I'm going to find him in in the among the people, and then I'm going to ask him if he if if he were, was able to finish. In the meantime, uh, I know that uh, Barbara uh, asked a question: Will the links and slides be available later or emailed? Um, we're going to send. Uh, we we are recording this the session, and um, we'll post an archive up on our on, on the site uh, edchatinteractive.org, um, and also the link that that Ken gave earlier. We'll uh, post that link also. So, and I see that that uh, Chris uh, answered the question, and I'm going to um, pass quick Chris's answer also to Ken. I'm going to bring myself down. I'm going to search for Ken and uh, find out when he wants to come back up. Uh, the first question that I got was, how does how does uh, how do you make sure that the kids are accountable? And I guess that we all teach in different schools. And so the kids that I have less power over, if you will, who care less about the grades, um, those kids are my lower levels, uh, and I just flip in the classroom. But I'm not, not everybody's watching the same flip. Because they're in different places in the curriculum, they, one may be watching one video while another's having a conversation while a third kid's actually working on an assignment, and maybe three others are kind of in a group assignment. Uh, I mean, that's my big thing is that I want to get them all to the finish line, but they don't have to be in the same pace. Uh, the second way that I get them to do it, and this is typically at a more upper level, is they get as they don't get a quiz grade. They get a zero if they don't have some kind of notes, and they can't be like two two lines. They got to take reasonable notes, uh, and the kids find it easy because it's not a lot of work, and they know it's a reasonable requirement to watch 12 minutes, and a 12-minute video might take them 30 minutes to take notes on. Um, so that was the answer, I think, to Tom's two questions, and Barbara had a question. Barbara, it's all you. My question was uh, in regards to that last uh, question that you just posed there. Uh, can you hear me, Ken? Can you hear yes. me? OK, uh, the question was, you were asking, how do we use the flip classroom as an introduction to the the very first day of school, in other words, the next school year, 2015, 2016 school year, I'm going to get ready to start uh, start a class with a new group of, of students, new grade. Uh, what video exactly am I supposed to be using to introduce to uh, these new students that are coming in? Is it from the, are you, are you assuming that it's a video from a previous, previously flipped classroom that I'm bringing in as an introduction or Am I actually doing a video or presenting a video that was uh, collaboratively done that very first day? I'm not sure exactly what, what you were asking when you said, how do we use the flipping um, videos on the, you know, for the, as the beginning of the school year? Which grade level am I using? So I was lost. I was yeah, great what question. You were, what you were referring to as far as the, you know, the videos being used. Great question, and I, this brings in a little perspective that we often forget, and I'm certainly forgetting, I should have explained. My first day of school is always getting to know the kids. I don't do anything academic. I literally go around the room and we have exercises to meet each other because I think that we all would agree, a great classroom, you know personal histories of the students and they know something about you. So at the end of the class of the first day, I give them the video and I say, watch it and then come in the second day and that's where I always, in the past, I haven't had a video, but I might have had an article or something for them to look at, which is a hook for the year. Why is it important to study world history? Why, is, why should we take English? Something that makes them think more than the state legislature has made them take this class. And so that's why I said in the case of the example I gave you, econ, let's look at water uh, a lack of water or not enough water, at least in certain parts of the world. And then I will tie that to economics and the study of economics when we get into that second day and use that as my introduction to the whole class. 
And then I even will go on and model the flip class. Uh, here's a video you're going to watch tonight. Here's exactly what I want you to do. Here's how you might take some notes on it. And, and so kind of do the here wherewithal of the class on that second day. And then the third day, we're in it and we're moving. Tom, you had a question? Uh, you, you, you kind of answered it before. Um, you know, I personally, uh, I, I don't believe in homework unless it's extremely necessary. Um, I, I'm kind of following Alfie Cohn in that regard. More and more research says that, that homework doesn't do any good. Um, and, and, and that's that's my biggest problem with, with the whole flip thing. Too many people take advantage of that. But, you know, uh, my concern is um, when you when you put something out for homework and then you prepare an entire class lesson based on everybody doing that homework, my experience has been half the class is not going to do the homework. Um, if if in fact I were to to do this the flipped model, I think I would make all of the videos available to all of the students so that they could access them at home at their at their own convenience in their own time frames as many times as they wanted to. But I, I think I would use the beginning of the class to uh, to show the entire video again for those kids who failed to do it. And, you know, I, I kind of feel like if you can't get it done in 45 minutes, you're doing something wrong. Right. And what I would might suggest is that rather than one, all my videos, I have playlists that the kids have access to. They have access to all our Google Drive documents all year. So uh, it's not like they see it once and it goes away. Uh, I find actually kids who come in, I get a lot of kids coming and going. I'm very transient area. So, like last year, I got a month before the SOL, our state exam, just four weeks, and I had him watch all my videos. We discussed each one, and he passed the state exam. Granted, a bright kid, but he had no world history. Uh, and so I found that a great kind of catch-up technique. But I would say in your case, Tom, I would take the ki half the kids who have watched the video and have them move on, and the other kids pull your earbuds out or get these, you know, cheap things that I buy for my kids that are three dollars on Amazon and listen to the video um, and again you can flip at the same time but I think the thing we need to my we don't all have to march at once the marching at once technique was started as we all know in the industrial revolution so we could all be good factory workers we don't all have to be in the same exact spot now that it will drive you crazy um, if you have people in many different spots as I do but the point is that some kids are going to learn some techniques a lot or some information a lot more quickly than others, and those kids should be able to go on. I mean, in my ideal world, a class may be done in April, and you move on to the next one. Now, we haven't gotten to that in education yet. Um, but it's 410, and I, I need to get home to my son, and you guys have a place to go. So, Tom, if you can put that slide back on so I can kind of wrap it up. Uh, we can't see the slide, Tom. Okay, so the only p thing you need from this whole presentation, if you want to get something or look into it more in depth, is if you go to bit.ly.com slash my last name, Hala Ed Chat. bit.ly.com slash Hala Ed Chat. It takes you to one of my blog pages. And I got a video of how to make a videos. I, I have this PowerPoint and a few other things that uh, links that you might find helpful. I also notice on when you go to that site, you get my Gmail address. Feel free to email me. I get people from all over the world emailing me. Um, or follow me on Twitter and you get stuff and, and or not. Um, and I appreciate your time here today. I hope you learned something uh, new and uh, look forward to collaborating more with you guys in the future. Well, thank you, Ken. Um, I'm, you know, some some good conversation, some great points, um, and I'd like to. Uh, well, in addition to thanking you, thank thank you for the people who came. Uh, this is going to be posted on the website, and we'll also put the link up, uh, the information, the uh, Bitly link that that you had before. I'm going to uh, bring you down for a second, Ken. Um,
Well, actually, you know something? I think we might as well end. I was going to sh show people what we're going to have for next week, um, but uh, we'll be sending out an email to everybody, so you'll 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 see what the sessions are going to be. We're having a session on Thursday, uh, which should be really interesting, which is about leading schools, and we're going to have a session uh, coming up on. Um, we're going to have a session next week as well. So, Ken. Um, say hi to your son. Uh, have a good have a good evening. I hope everybody has a great Memorial Day weekend. And um, this is Mitch Weisberg for EdChat Interactive, and I'm signing off. Thanks, everybody.